Let's pray together. Oh Lord, we are confident that they will. Our trials and sufferings will give way to victory. The end is sure. You have won. You have secured the future. And you will not let anyone go who belongs to you. But one day we will be finally home. Oh, how we long for that day. It feels so normal here to suffer. We can get comfortable in this life, in this skin, in this mixed up world. But our home is with you in heaven. And all who belong to you feel this longing, this homelessness for our permanent residence, our homesickness, our desire to be with you. We have just sung it. God, we pray that it would be our life's song, undistracted, undimmed. I pray even this morning by your word that you would recalibrate our thinking, that you would reset our affections, our purpose, our identity, our priorities. May they all belong to you. We pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that your word would have its way in our hearts that we would be changed for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Open your Bibles to the book of Revelation. and We're continuing Revelation chapter 7 as we make our way verse by verse through this depiction of future world history. I'd invite you to put your eyes on this text with me. We'll read together Revelation chapter 7 Verses 9 through 17. John records, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. The blessing and the glory and the wisdom and the thanksgiving and the honor and the power and the strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, These, clothed in white robes, who are they? And from where have they come? And I said to him, My Lord, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. And they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God. They serve him day and night in his sanctuary. And he who sits on the throne will dwell over them. They will hunger no longer, nor thirst any more, nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will shepherd them and will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. In this section of the Bible, this last book of the Bible, we've been looking at the period of time known as the Tribulation. And in our chronological approach to this book, we will soon enter upon what Jesus terms as the Great Tribulation, the worst period of human history, unprecedented in its scope of violence, tumult, and chaos. The world has never seen anything like it. And after it, there will never be another time like it. The world has seen some bad days. But this series of bad days, lasting seven years, and the Great Tribulation, half of that, three and a half years, will be the worst of all time. And we met with this question at the end of Revelation chapter 6, the great day of the wrath of God has come, and who can stand? And we've been introduced to two parties in Revelation 7 that do, in fact, stand when God's wrath comes. 
The first half of Revelation 7 detailed those Jewish remnants, the believers, the ones who come to faith from the 12 tribes of Israel in the beginning of the tribulation and most likely become witnesses to the gospel throughout the tribulation. We saw them in verses 1 to 8. And in verse 9 to the end of the chapter, we come to a different group. Not 144,000 Jews that could be counted from 12 tribes, but, and, but an uncountable number of people from every tribe and tongue and nation and people from all over the earth who believe in Jesus during the Great Tribulation. And we begin looking at them last week. This morning we'll pick up where we left off in verse 13. The point of this section of Revelation 7 is the discovery of tribulation saints who are ushered from the darkest days on earth into the happiness of heaven's glory. These tribulation saints find themselves in the period of earth's history that is the worst, the blackest, the darkest, and then very quickly find themselves in heaven. Who are they? That's what we'll discover this morning. Look down at verse 13. One of the elders, one of those 24 heavenly beings surrounding the throne, answered, saying to me, says John, these clothed in the white robes, who are they and from where have they come? This elder asks John two questions. The identity of this uncountable number of the redeemed and their origin. And, and by the way, he's not asking what country did they come from. John already knows they're from every tribe and tongue and people and nation on the earth. He's not asking about their ethnic origin or their geopolitical origin. The question on the mouth of the elder here is, from what situation are they coming? How did they get here? What situation did they come out of? And notice how John replies. He says, you know. That's a great statement from the Apostle John. John doesn't know how to answer this question. He doesn't know how to describe this group. He doesn't know their identity. He, he hasn't, it hasn't been revealed to him yet uh, what situation they came out of. And notice verse 13, one of the elders answered. That's kind of a funny way to introduce this. What question was asked? Did John have a quizzical look on his face? I don't think though, this is a, a common way in the, in the revelation, uh, both Old Testament and New Testament, of prophetic material for the heavenly realm to draw out information that the prophet needs to know, the prophet needs to record, and the prophet needs to tell us. So John needs to know who these people are, and we need to know. So this elder in heaven asks John in order to draw out this conversation. Why does John not know who they are? These are clothed in white robes. The white robes here are an emblem of perfect holiness. These are people for whom their declaration of righteousness meets their experience of righteousness. Anybody alive today who's a follower of Jesus has been declared righteous in the gospel of God on the basis of faith. You believe that Jesus paid for your sins and God in heaven, in his courtroom, declares you to be righteous. He makes a judicial declaration that you have never done anything wrong and you've always done everything right. It doesn't meet with our experience yet, but that is heaven's judicial declaration because you believe. But these ones, clothed in white robes, now match by their experience what has been declared by grace. They are sinless. They are sinners no more. They are incapable of sin. They have no more sin nature. They have no more sinful thoughts or intentions or motives or words or actions. They have no more inclination to sin. They are now perfected in righteousness. Consistently, the white robes, the garb of heaven in Scripture are seen as emblems of perfect righteousness that clothe the redeemed. This is the reality of believers of every era who are born sinning by nature, born in a condition of being enslaved to sin, and then as believers are forgiven and yet still tainted by sin in this life. 
But in heaven, we will be sinless. Notice too that this group in white robes, are, they are in heaven. They're not depicted on earth. In other words, this isn't the millennial kingdom yet. This predates Jesus' return to the earth that is described in Revelation 19 and his establishment of a thousand year reign on the earth described in Revelation 20. This is before these things. So this mass of people clothed in white robes whose experience matches their declaration are in heaven, not on earth. And they are also, according to this text, in a temple or a sanctuary. We discover in Revelation 21, 22, that there is no temple in the eternal state. When God brings about a new heavens and a new earth, that's usually what we think about when we say the word heaven. We mean the eternal state that goes on forever and ever and ever. There is no temple in the eternal state. That is when heaven comes down to earth and, and the, the dwelling place of God comes right down in city form on a new earth. We're not there yet in this scene. They're not on the earth. There is a temple here. And they're not resurrected yet. These are bodiless souls. We learn this from Revelation 20 verse 4. The souls of them... Speaking about this group, those who died during the tribulation who are believers, will be resurrected at the return of Christ. Revelation 24 says they come to life and then reign with Jesus for a thousand years on the earth. So this group is not in heaven. They do not, or they are in heaven. They're not on the earth. They do not have bodies. This is not yet the eternal state. And they are not the church. The church at this point has already experienced resurrection into glorified bodies. And yet this is a vast crowd, an uncountable number of people, and an international crowd from every nation and tribe and people and tongue. John, steeped in the Old Testament, and an apostle and an elder, a pastor in a church, now receiving this prophetic revelation, gets fast-forwarded into this scene in heaven and sees this group, and he doesn't know who they are. Who is this group, and how did they get here? The elder asks and answers the question for John and for us. Notice what he says. These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. Verse 14. They come out of the great tribulation. That unprecedented three and a half year period, the worst period of human history ever, no time like it before, no time like it after, this massive crowd of forgiven sinners comes out of it. That is, they are recipients of mercy in a time of wrath. God is pouring out his wrath on the earth dwellers, and yet down to the 11th hour of human history, he is still saving sinners, and sinners in massive quantities. What we see in this text before us is the way they are described. We'll look at eight descriptions this morning of this group. First of all, we discover that they are alive. Look down at verse 14. These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes. They made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They came out of the great tribulation is an interesting way to describe their death, their mortality their physical demise. It talks about physical death for these believers as something like an exit ramp. And details are not given about each of their exit ramps from life on this earth. Some are martyrs, according to Revelation 20 verse 4, killed specifically because they believe in Jesus. Others perhaps die of starvation, privation, and exposure. And I think we get the flavor of that from a contrast of verse 16. When they are in heaven, they will no longer hunger, no longer thirst, nor will the sun beat down on them. Others no doubt die in the chaos and violence of a world beset by rebellious anarchy. But all of them suffer. And all of them died. In this scene, they are depicted as coming out of the great tribulation. And, and this verb coming out has a continual aspect to it. The picture here is a continual stream of believers leaving the earth, not all at one time, but one by one as they succumb to physical death during the tribulation. 
But now, after death, we see them in this scene very much alive. They have come out. In other words, no more tribulation for them. No more suffering. It is all in the rear view mirror. This is a wonderful picture for us. This picture that entrance into heaven occurs immediately after death. This is true for believers of every era. There's no middle world. Uh, there's no river sticks you have to cross if you've got the right stuff. There's no soul sleep, no gray, semi-conscious, wandering state. But immediate presence in heaven with God, alive and awake. Do you remember what Jesus said to a thief on a cross? Today, you will be with me in paradise. What does Paul say? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Think about that, Christian. When you take your last breath in this life, when you close your eyes for the last time, the one who said, death shall not separate you from the love of Christ, the one who said, I will never leave you or forsake you, will shepherd you, walk you, hold your hand from this life into the next. That is a tremendous comfort. He never leaves. And these ones who are alive in this scene are rightly more alive than they've ever been. No longer subject to mortality. Secondly, we discover they are forgiven. We read in verse 14 that they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This is a picture of forgiveness and transformation. This washing is the removal of filth, the whitening is likely a reference to the ongoing cleaning up that Jesus does in the progress of sanctification. And this is a remarkable paradox. They wash their robes, did you see it? In blood. That doesn't make sense. A blood that makes clean. We think of blood stains. We think of having blood on your hands. But this blood cleanses. This blood whitens. This blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, makes the filthy clean. God makes that great invitation in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Come to me. You who have scarlet sins, blood-red filth, come to me and your sins will be as white as snow and white like wool. The blood of Christ, of course, is a reference to his death. Not, not some magical property of his physical blood. It is an emblem of his substitutionary sacrifice. His bloodshed in my place brings me to God. He died in my place. The believer says, Jesus died for me. And that little word for means substitution. It was I who should have died. It was I who was guilty. And Jesus went to the cross, bearing my sins in his body on the cross before God, taking the punishment I deserved. So that I, the guilty, go free as he, the innocent one, was condemned. How does a sinner like you, or a sinner like me, with dirty hands, a dirty mind, filthy garments, get clean? Where do you get a white robe fit for heaven? Only by the blood of Christ. It is only the blood of Christ that makes sinners clean. Jesus' death is the only means of forgiveness. And at the cross, he did all the work required for atonement. There's nothing we could contribute that would qualify for this work. We would only contaminate. This is why you can't mix grace and works in terms of your standing before God. The only thing that qualifies a sinner to stand before a holy God is the finished work of Jesus at the cross. We believe. Revelation 1.5 says, Jesus Christ loved us and released us from our sins by his blood. Revelation 5.9 tells us that Jesus purchased for God with his blood these people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. 
Revelation 22, 14 says, blessed or happy are those who wash their robes so that they may have access to the tree of life. How do you get eternal life? Very simple, the blood of Christ. It's the only way. Jesus' death in your place. Thirdly, we see of these people assembled in heaven that they are present with God. Look down at verse 15. For this reason, they are before the throne of God. For this reason takes us back to what we just said. There's only one reason that any of these people are there. There there are no alternate paths to heaven, but only Christ's cleansing. It is so clear from the Bible that our works could never be a basis for entrance to heaven. Human religion could never be a basis for entrance. For this reason, they are present with God. Nothing can give you a right standing besides the blood of Christ. 6.17, again, asks the question, who could stand in the day of God's wrath? Only blood-washed sinners. And what is the result? They are before the throne of God. They are present there. If you read your Bible and you just ask the question, what happens when a sinner shows up before God? Men fall down dead or as dead? Hebrews tells us it is a a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. To go unclothed in these white robes of the righteousness of Christ means to enter God's glorious presence exposed. Just what you have and what you've done. Does not meet God's standards. But here, these ones are in the presence of God without dread, without terror. They are clothed in white, washed in the blood, purchased out of sin by the spotless lamb. They are qualified. They have been made perfect. And what do we have in the presence of God? What what do they experience in the throne room of God? Psalm 1611 says, in God's presence is fullness of joy. These have never been happier. Think of your happiest moments here in this life. Think about them for a moment. It's a memory now, unless you're thinking this sermon is the happiest moment of your life. Then we need to talk. Like the steam off your cup of coffee this morning when you walked into the cold drizzle. It's gone. Maybe you have a photograph. Maybe you have a fading memory of of some happy moment. Whisked away by the tiniest of breezes. But these here in the presence of God, experiencing fullness of joy that will never be whisked away. It will never fade. It will never be diminished. Paul says, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord is better by far than everything you've experienced here in the body. The psalmist writes that he would wish to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than be anywhere else. Could I just be on the edges? Could I just look in? I want to be there. The psalm says, better is one day in your presence than thousands of the best days anywhere else. And those who have come out of the darkest days of human history now revel in the bliss of the glory of heaven. Fourthly, we see they are worshiping. Look down at verse 15. They are before the throne of God and they serve Him or worship Him day and night in His temple. They serve Him day and night. This word for serve is a word for religious service. It's it's one of the words for worship. And and our English word worship comes from the Old English worth-ship. It is to declare the worth of something, to acknowledge the value of something. And these tribulation saints find themselves in the presence of infinite value, immeasurable worth. How can finite minds take in the infinite grandeur, infinite beauty, and infinite excellence of God? Frankly, it will be too much to take in. It will be too good to behold. Their enjoyment of the immediate presence of God 
his glory radiating out in perfect goodness for the unending delight of the redeemed will be the occupation of every blood-bought believer. It's what we're destined for. And these ones who will be rescued late in human history, at that 11th hour, they will serve him day and night. That's an idiom for constantly. Uh, There's no day and night in the throne room in heaven. That is, they will not be bored. They will not have some desire to move on to something else. Okay, I got that. Enjoyment of God, great. His infinite greatness just filled up my finite puniness and now I'm ready for something else. Listen, heaven will not be boring. (laughs) We tend to project our favorite things onto the number infinity, sort of multiply infinity by your favorite thing, and we go, oh, that's not going to be good. That is not the Bible's description of heaven. To come into the presence of God, to be in His temple will not be to be bored, nor distracted. It will mean to be thrilled beyond your wildest comprehension. Can you imagine undistracted worship? Where you're not seeing something else that might be interesting. Not thinking about something else. I don't know about you, I, sometimes I have to pray until I'm praying. And even after I've prayed until I'm praying, I'm still thinking about what's for lunch. As if that even remotely compares to spending time in the presence of the glory of God. There, it will be impossible to think about a peanut butter and honey sandwich. As if it compared with the infinite glory of the radiating goodness of God. It's hard to even imagine these things. We will be uninterrupted by sin, by trial, by temptation, by lesser things. We will be totally enveloped in the love of God. We will not be able to take our eyes off the spectacle of radiating glory. We will be amazed, enthralled, and totally captivated. We discover fifthly in verse 15 that they are protected. They are protected. He who sits on the throne will dwell over them. What does it mean to dwell over them? Uh, To dwell means to take up one's residence. The word literally means to spread one's tent, to to set up your tent. It's It's a camping picture. It was used of the Shekinah glory when the, the, the visible, manifest glory of God would, would camp out over the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies, in the temple and in the tabernacle. It was used of God's glorious presence in the tabernacle during their wilderness wanderings. The same word was used in their desert wanderings of the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. It dwelt there or it tented there. Listen to Ezekiel thirty-seven twenty-seven. This promise of God He says, my dwelling place, same word, will be with them and I will be their God and they will be my people. There's no better promise than that the God who is infinite goodness would choose to be with us. It's a stunning promise when you think about it. All of the Old Testament sacrifices and the curtains and the holy of holies inside the other tent, all of those things were designed not to keep God away from us, but to allow a holy God to actually dwell in the midst of sinful people. Because until sin is finally eradicated from humanity, humanity could not stand in the glorious presence of a holy God. And so God forgives and then he cleanses and brings his people into absolute perfection, clothing them in white robes so that they can stand in that glorious presence and have immediate access to him forever. The statement of dwelling is a a statement of his presence and his protection. God dwelling with his people in the wilderness, spreading his tent over them in the wilderness. It was a protection from enemies, a covering from catastrophe. The visible presence of God was to be a comfort to the people of Israel. It would have been comforting to know God is with us. It also would have been intimidating. If you were not on a right track with God, if you were not on short accounts with God, the the ground might open up. If you decided to worship other gods instead of gods, you could be in a lot of trouble. And there were times where the people said, we don't want to see God like that anymore, it's too scary. 
They made Moses cover his face after Moses had been in the presence of God. But then you have Moses saying, if, if you don't go with us in the wilderness, we're not going. We need you. This protection was a safety from harm, a protection against enemies, protected and preserved for life in God's presence. And if God is for you, who could be against you? Think of all the big, bad, and scary things that could put themselves up against you, Christian. And God is bigger and badder and scarier than them all. And if He is on your side, if He has declared His love for you, if He has declared you righteous in His courtroom, no one could bring accusation, no one could separate from you, you from His love. And who could be against you? No one. This great promise to the tribulation saints describes an experience that all believers of every era will enjoy. The presence of God is an impenetrable fortress of protection for His beloved ones. You draw close to Him, you find your safety in Him, and you are forever protected in His love. This word for uh, dwelling as a tent or spreading out a tent, it, in the New Testament it's only used by John, John the Apostle recording the Revelation. It, it's used interestingly in John 1.14. The Word became flesh, that is the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, took on human flesh in the person of Jesus. And then John says in verse 114, He dwelt among us. Same word, He tented with us here on earth. Turn to Revelation chapter 21. Really the Bible ends with this great promise. It culminates all the great promises of the Bible. Revelation 21.3 I heard a loud voice from the throne. This is speaking of the new heavens and the new earth, the eternal state when everything is wrapped up and done. Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men and he will dwell among them and they shall be his people and God himself will be among them. This is the glorious promise of the presence of God. It leads us to the sixth description of these tribulation saints. They are satisfied they are satisfied. Look down at verse 16. They will hunger no longer, nor thirst anymore, nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. They are satisfied. This verse picks up the language of Isaiah chapter 49, which is spoken to a believing remnant of Israel who one day will be a light to the nations. And here... This applies to the uncountable number of redeemed Gentiles. Uh, this language is now is, is applied to a group of people from every tongue and tribe and nation. And what will be their end? Complete and total satisfaction. No more hunger, no more thirst, no more suffering under the beating of the sun and the heat. Now Charles Spurgeon had a hard time understanding this part of the promise. No more sunshine, no more, no more warmth of the rays of the sun. Just, no, he, he pastored in London. In fact, he would get so sick every year from the cold and the drizzle that he would spend December and January on the French Riviera, in the Mediterranean, just to warm up and get healthy again. He was so sick, he couldn't continue his ministry. He needed the sun. So he said, I, I don't understand this part of the verse. I think we understand it in Arizona. And in the Near East, we understand that prolonged exposure out in the sun, even in our winter months, can be deadly. It saps energy, it dehydrates. Most of the people who have died in the Grand Canyon, and I have read the entire encyclopedic entry of every known human death in the Grand Canyon, most of them were from exposure. The sun beat down and killed them. This promise would be a particular comfort for believers coming out of the Great Tribulation. They would be on the run from violence and persecution. They would be unable to buy food without the mark of the beast on their wrist or on their forehead. Food will be scarce, drinking water a luxury, and by the end of this awful period, everyone on earth will have been homeless. 
So when God says here, he will spread his tent over them, he means they will be home. They will be home. And and what that means is they will be sheltered from all pain and hardship and misery and affliction. They will no longer be hungry. They will no longer thirst. Every need will be satisfied. This will be absolutely true, physically speaking. But this hungering and thirsting goes beyond this. Do you remember Jesus' words when he said, Blessed are you who hunger and thirst after righteousness. You'll be satisfied. Do you feel that? Do you feel the moral bankruptcy in your own heart and just long for the world to be put right, for your own heart to be put right? Hunger and thirst for that and you will find in heaven perfect satisfaction. This no more hunger, no more thirst, no more beaten by the sun is shorthand to describe the fulfillment of every need. There will be nothing left to desire. There will be no unknown tease of pleasure just around the corner that I haven't found yet. You you know that desire in the human heart? You you experiment with something and, and it works for a little while. You think it satisfies and then it doesn't. A Snickers only goes so far. And then you need something else. And you try something else for a while and, and that wears out. And you try something else for a while and that wears out. And, and we never learn the lesson that nothing under the sun can bring ultimate satisfaction. You have to look above the sun for these things. No one in heaven will sing the U2 anthem, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Every need will be met. Every desire satisfied. The presence of God satisfies every longing, exceeds every expectation. And it will exceed it, not like the way we get discomfort from eating too much of our favorite meal after not eating for a couple days. Have you done that? Oh, my birthday dinner's coming up. I can't wait. I'm not going to eat for two days. You don't feel good after having a triple portion of birthday dinner. It will not be like that with God. The satisfaction that God brings is the kind that makes you supremely content and eager for more and supremely content that there is an infinity more to be had. Can you even begin to imagine? Can you imagine no more discomforts? Sometimes we think of of really big pains and trials and suffering, but just the discomfort, discomfort of sitting one place and then feeling a little stiff. Standing for a while and your feet are sore. You've got your arm in one position and your fingers fall asleep. If you just start to catalog all the things you notice in your physical body, You can make a really long list of things that are mildly to severely uncomfortable. Pressures, pain, a strain, just unpleasantries, inflexibility, little weaknesses, declines in hearing and sight and smell. And then think about emotional discomforts. Make a whole catalog of ways we just don't feel right. Things aren't as they should be. And then there are, of course, big ones. Soul-crushing emotional weights. Broken relationships. Sadnesses. I think the older you get, the more you see your friends die. Some of the early bright light of youthy optimism fades All of those things will be gone. Every discomfort, every pain, every emotional burden. And in heaven, there will be no diminishing returns. You know the law of diminishing returns? Economists and drug addicts know this law. You know, the economists know there's a level at which you keep putting stuff in, you're going to get less profit out. It, It sort of caps off. The drug addict tragically knows by experience the first hit of some drug is a big deal. 
and you need to take more of the drug to feel less of the experience the next time. And it just diminishes and diminishes and diminishes. In heaven, no diminishing returns. There's no adrenaline wear off in heaven. No buyer's remorse. You know, the, the lead up, I'm really, really excited about this thing. You get there and then it's like, yeah, it's, it's good. There's no letdown. No unmet expectations. No boredom with your favorite pastime. Not in the presence of God. Never in the presence of God. Not after 10 minutes, not after 10 years, 10 millennia, or 10 eternities. As Jonathan Edwards said, every day in heaven is better than the day before ad infinitum. What a sweet mercy it is to die in the Lord. You think about that with those you've known in Christ who have gone home. They don't want to come back here. They're better by far. Listen, that's not, a, that's not a cheap saying. Sometimes at funerals, people say, oh, he's in a better place. Only if he's in Christ. And if he is in Christ, better is just not the right word. <laughs> it doesn't even compare. And it is difficult for us who remain to say goodbye to loved ones. But it is inconceivably wonderful for those who have already departed to be with him. Seventh, we see they are shepherded. Look at verse 17. For the lamb at the center of the throne will shepherd them and will guide them to the springs of the water of life. Notice the beginning of verse 17, this little word for, it's an explanation. Why will these rescued sinners experience such satisfaction in the presence of God? For or because the lamb at the center of the throne will shepherd them. Jesus is the shepherd. In Revelation 12.5 and Revelation 19.15, we have the same word for Jesus as shepherd, and there he is described as the shepherd who will rule or shepherd the nations with a rod of iron, uh, one of inflexible righteousness. But here, this shepherding is directed to the people he has purchased with his own blood, and he cares for them as a good shepherd cares for the sheep. You know, the very familiar psalm, Yahweh is my shepherd, therefore I have no want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. All of that gets fulfilled here. In this scene, we see the gentle, compassionate care that meets every need. It's a paradox. The lamb is a shepherd. Does that sound funny? Yes, the sheep that went to the slaughter to pay for our sins is also the good shepherd who tends his sheep with compassion, with gentleness, with diligence, and with strength. It's interesting that we still have needs in heaven, and he meets them. Recognize the implication of that? You never become independent. Okay, I need God here, but when I get to heaven, I'll be sinless, so I won't need him anymore. That would be bad. A heaven where you had some independent existence, where you lived without God unto yourself forever and ever, that would be boring and awful. The reality is he shepherds his people in a continual relationship of selfless giving and tender care. Notice also in verse 17, he will guide them to springs of the water of life. He will guide them. Some, some versions say he will lead them. We will still need him to guide us to what is ultimate and to what is good. And he will be faithful as a shepherd to get us there forever. And notice where he takes us, verse 17, to the springs of the water of life. A spring is a never-ending supply. He doesn't take us to a cup of water or a bucket of water, or a reservoir of water, but a never-ending spring of water, which here is called the water of life. The word order in the original emphasizes this word life. It's at the front. This is life in its essence. In other words, Jesus is shepherding his people forever and ever into the endless supply of what life truly is. 
Do you remember what he said about himself, John 14, 6? He is the way, the truth, and the life. How does eternal life get defined by Jesus, John 17, 3? Knowing him. Knowing him is eternal life. Do you remember back in John chapter 4, Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well? He actually put this in front of her, way ahead of the book of Revelation, way ahead of the eternal state. He he made this promise. Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst ever. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Listen, no man could make a promise like that. But the Son of God could and did. He is the one who promised it and brings it to fulfillment, laid down his life to bring his people to that end. And all of that comes to fulfill the promise laid out in Isaiah 55. God there gives this great invitation. He says, yo, attention, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You who have no money, come, buy, and eat. In other words, this is a free gift. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me. Eat what is good. Delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. This is the invitation to the great promise of the Bible. Summed up this way. I will be their God and they will be my people. It's the great news. There is a theology in your Bible of where God dwells. It's a good study. Start in Genesis, make your way to Revelation, and just ask, where does God live? Of course, he lives in heaven, uh, sometimes called the third heaven or heaven proper. That is his special dwelling place outside of the cursed universe. In the Garden of Eden, he dwelt with man and woman in immediate fellowship. Of course, after the garden, that fellowship was broken and God dwelt in a tent in the wilderness and then a more permanent building in Solomon's temple. Fascinatingly, God dwelt with us in the person of his son when Jesus came to earth. And then we will see that God will dwell on the earth for a thousand year reign on the earth during the millennial kingdom. And after a final rebellion, heaven and earth wiped away, a new heavens and a new earth created, and heaven proper will come down to the new earth, and the great promise of God is he will dwell with his people. This is the great promise we have to look forward to. It leads to the last description, number eight, they are happy. Notice the last sentence of verse 17, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Does that mean there's crying in heaven, but God's there just at the right times to wipe away the tears? No, this is a picture of God forever wiping away sorrow, pain, misery, suffering, sadness, sickness, and death. There's no more room to cry. You know, a compassionate parent stoops down, looks eye to eye with the child who is hurt or sad, The tears have welled up in the eyes and streaked down the dusty cheeks. And the mom or the dad tenderly wipes those tears from the face of the child in love. Think about the timing of that tender parent wiping the tears. When does that happen? It happens when the threat is gone. When the danger is retired. When the fear is done. Mom and dad are there. Comfort is here. The suffering is over. Let me wipe these tears from your eyes. And in this scene in Revelation 7, the suffering is over and the suffering is never to return. This scene is not a reprieve of sadness. It's not a time out on misery. It's not intermission. It's not a silver lining in a dark cloud. This is home. And it is the place of profound, unshakable happiness. Never gloom, never glum, no more unmet longings, no wistful feelings, to never again feel alone or out of place, but to be enveloped in the joy of glory and the love of the Father forever and ever. 
and to never fully appreciate it. To grow and grow and keep growing in our appreciation of infinite excellencies forever and ever. Think about transitioning from this life to the next, either for tribulation saints or believers of any era. You can feel like here you're wandering, lost, disoriented, like you're on a hiking trip and and you lost your way. And then you get home. What relief. Here is labor, hardship, toil, agonizing struggle against physical things and against sin and against the world. And there, rest. Here we are famished, there filled. Here we are parched, there we are quenched. Here isolated, longing and lonely, and there we are loved. Here we are persecuted, there forever and finally protected. What does this look into the future do for us this morning? I think this is a preparation for suffering. If we understand this correctly, we start to get a glimpse of the truth of 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18 that light and momentary affliction produces for us an eternal weight of glory. Listen, affliction is never light, it is never momentary when we think about the affliction. But when you put it on the scales of eternity, of what it means to be in the presence of God, Paul could rightly call all of his afflictions light and momentary. This also recalibrates our identity and purpose. Who are you and what are you doing here? Important questions. Listen to Colossians 3. You have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. It's a different perspective. This builds for us anticipation of eternal joys. We don't have all our eggs in the basket of this life. Christians can suffer and sacrifice for the benefit of others and for the progress of the gospel because all our, bas- all our eggs are in the basket of eternity. Life is short. Hell is real. Heaven is home. We just live different. There's a lesson here on waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord is simply trusting the Lord multiplied by time. And we all have to wait. We don't always wait well. But these tribulation saints in heavenly bliss, sinless, in white robes, they're not yet at the new heavens and new earth. They're not yet at Revelation 20. They're still awaiting glorified bodies. They're still awaiting the reign of Christ on the earth. There's something important for us in seeing that. They're perfectly happy. And the culmination of all things is not yet. The fixing of the cosmos is not yet done in this scene. I think there's fuel for us in Revelation 7 for missions. We see God's heart. See God's heart to the Jew and to the Gentile. We see a Jewish restoration in chapter 7 in faith and a global Gentile conversion through that same faith. We need to have God's heart in these things. There's help here for us in thinking about death too. Do you need to rework your deathology? How you think about your own mortality as a believer? Truly, you died when you came to Christ. We just read it in Colossians 3. We read it in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. We read it in, Galatians, or in Romans chapter 6. All of us who have been joined to Christ by faith have died with him. The, the old man is gone. You are a new creature. Eternal life, according to Jesus, begins when you believe. What does that mean for the end of your earthly life here? You will pass through physical mortality, but the New Testament doesn't call it death. We just get to go home. Finally, this is a great invitation to you who are here this morning and recognize that you are weary, thirsty, hungry, exposed, filthy. Come this day. Wash your robes in the blood of the Lamb 
and you will find him to be your good shepherd. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are good, glorious, great, powerful, and humble. You lay down your life at the cross so that we who are sinners might have life in you. Thank you for this forward look into the throne room in heaven. I know there are many in this room who suffer. Many this week who are suffering from seasonal ailments. Many in our body who suffer chronically from things they will not recover of in this life. We are all on a physical decline headed toward our own mortality. Oh God, would you shepherd us home with contentment and joy and missions and love and humility and gratitude. We ask it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.